Well, hi, everyone. Uh, I wanted to make sure with our Yao experience here in Brisbane that we continued our Lord of the Rings theme. And so we're going to bring that here. You might have heard from Eno's uh, keynote yesterday. Uh, maybe you uh, checked out uh, Dave's, you know, one rule to rule them all. So now you can uh, bring it to a close and we can uh, talk about how one doesn't simply add MFA. We're going to kind of talk about our multi-factor authentication journey and hopefully we'll learn something at the end of it. So really, uh, what I want you guys to uh, take from this is to know what multi-factor authentication is, how to secure your accounts, the different types that are available out there, and how can we help our users help our application, and uh, potential testing steps and uh, best practices that we can all consider to help out our applications. But things I don't want you to worry about is uh, taking notes or pictures. If you want these slides, I already got them available for you. I gotcha. So uh, just hit up that QR code, and that's the speaker deck, all available. So if there was something that you're wondering about or need to remember later, just uh, go ahead and uh, take a picture of that so you can really just concentrate, and we can all learn together here during this presentation. Also, there is no th thing as a foolish question. Always make sure to reframe that. That's a clarifying question going on right there. So let's let our journey begin. Picture this. You are the owner of the coveted Instagram account at Awesome. You're going about your day, you know, enjoying your 89,000 followers when you're a little bit hungry for some breakfast. You have some avocado toast. I hear that's popular in Australia, or maybe it was, and I'm totally outdated in my knowledge. And maybe you need to take a pic and upload that to your Instagram account when you receive a text message. It's from your mobile provider. It says something about your SIM card has been updated, and then your phone restarts itself. You have your partner call you, but your phone number is not ringing. What in the world just happened here? So let's take it back to the beginning, when you signed up for Instagram. You're pretty jazzed. You found out that Ad Awesome was available, and so you go ahead and you fill out those uh, personal details that you need to get yourself an Instagram account. Put in your phone number, put in that uh, awesome username, and then put in a password. Psh, password seems totally legit and very secure. We'll go with that. You know a little bit something about security, so you're like, hey, yeah, opt into this uh, text message thing. I'll enable that, I'm good to go. And then you work about the day, gaining your 89,000 followers, posting pics uh, about you know, maybe some Kiwi actors that you liked. And, but somebody was behind the scenes quietly coveting that short and sweet Insta handle. Where'd you come from, Sauron? But does this look like a malicious actor or a hacker to you? I don't think so either. Let's, let's try and fix that. <laughs> ah, a little memmy, but it works. Oh, way better. OK, totally looks like a hack, legit hacker now. So what was this malicious actor up to? Well, they were calling your mobile provider using a little bit of social engineering. So let's say uh, the most recent uh, city credit card hack just happened. And maybe you had some details that got out, your full name, your address, email, maybe even some bank account. What are those details? Well, that's something that your mobile provider uses to identify you. And so if they know them, what's to stop them from calling that mobile provider using those details and saying, hey, I lost my embedded uh, chip that's in my card. Maybe I dropped it. So I need a new one to be set up for that account. And so when that phone number is no lo longer associated with your SIM card, who is getting those text messages for that uh, verification? Certainly not you anymore. And uh, with your protection that you had at first, password, and your text messages aren't going into you, that Instagram account is no longer in your control. 
So if we kind of break it down on what they need to do, this is super low tech. Does it involve technology? Or does it just involve them needing to know a couple details and calling somebody up? This is a tweet from a Princeton professor, and they were doing some research into some US uh, telecoms. These are some of the uh, top five ones there on what sort of authentication methods they had to help protect their users. You can see red, bad. There's a lot of red. Yellow, you know, less bad, but is still fairly prevalent. And then that green, that little, little three columns of green don't have a ton of checks in them. And so they're not really doing all they can do to help with those authentication methods. But you're probably saying, you know, I don't really care about those US telecoms. Uh, what about some Aussie ones? Well, color me surprised, Australia. Uh, some of the, uh, the top two that I was able to find with this Telstra and a Vodafone actually have a ton of education out there for their uh, methods. Uh, if we could have redone this uh, and checked out what authentication methods they had for their providers or for their users, actually would have had a ton more green than the US one, so good job for you guys. Uh, but we are a global economy, and you probably have users that aren't necessarily just in, you, uh, in Australia. So you, we also do need to consider what mobile providers our users may be using. I've already said multi-factor authentication quite a bit of times, but let's make sure we are all on the same page on what is authentication. So this is just kind of that step a very fine that someone or something is who they say they are. And so that's the authentication of multi-factor authentication. But then what is those factors? Well, one could be your password. It is something you know. Then you have another method choice. You could have the possession, something you have, something you is, you control, it, it is something you have. Or it could be your identity, something you are. And then we're in technology, so we love our TLDs, three letter acronyms. So let me hit you with a couple more of these that all kind of mean the same thing. We got two factor authentication. So this was the one that you would see a lot in the US for a while, which is slowly kind of transitioning out. You have two step verification, which is Google's branding of the exact same thing. Then you have multi-factor authentication. This is kind of the more worldwide, more adopted uh, vernacular that I see associated with it. So that's kind of my uh, chosen way of let's just call it this. And then you may say 2F because somebody got really uh, lazy and just said two-factor. And we know these are uh, authentications that should have helped. Why the hell did we just get hacked then? Well, for us, SMS was the factor that it got used. It was something that we had, our phone number, but until we didn't have it. So that is no longer something that can help us. And something to consider for a lot of our users, they won't even have it enabled. If you don't have that additional friction there, how can it help them? So let's travel a little bit deeper and move on with our journey and figure out what are those different factor choices we could have out there? Well, we, we know SMS. Uh, you receive a text message on a phone. It's definitely common. Who has phones here today? Everyone? Yeah. So that's why it's ubiquitous, and it's so easy for our users because they already have it. They know it. They're familiar with it. But Unfortunately, this is also the most compromised, and it's one that hasn't been recommended by the National Institute of Standards and Technology since 2016, which would be in primary school if it was a kid. Uh, so <laughs> let's consider other choices going on here. Oh, yeah, uh, so we need to also consider, yes, SMS uh, authentication is bad. Let's dive into how worse it can actually get. 
There's this thing called SS7. It's single system number seven that is kind of the backing technology for all of the, well, not all, 800 or so uh, different telecommunication companies across the world, including Australia. And so what uh, a group of white hat hackers was able to prove uh, is that they could intercept text, uh, text messages at the actual telecom layer. And so they were intercepted, they were able to compromise a Bitcoin account, and uh, all they needed was a Gmail account that was already protected by that two-step verification. They just needed the full name, email address, and phone number. So, we've had fun. Let's pretend we're hackers now. How could we hack SMS authentication? Well, we could do this way. Maybe it's a little bit easier if you're, you know, trying to get a U.S. person versus an Aussie. Uh, but we could do a SIM swap. We just need to call up a telecom, pretend we're who, we say we're that person. This one might be a little bit more vulnerable for our, our Aussie friends, is that it's a port out scam. I know you guys have a lot of mandates that your telecom providers have to be able to move one phone number to another uh, telecom provider. That means you're vulnerable to a port out scan because I could say, hey, I'm you. I need, really need to move my telecom provider to maybe a US one or maybe somebody else. And uh, then it, that phone number is no longer in your possession. We could try to brute force the application itself. Maybe if they're not rotating their uh, stuff quite as quickly as they should, that means that a little short and sweet uh, verification code could be vulnerable to brute forcing. Or, you know, we want to go all in our technology. Let's just hit the SS7 network. So maybe moving on to greener pastures with our factor choice, let's check out what push-based notification is. So this is where you have an authorized device. I have my MacBook Pro. I have my new iPhone. Maybe not so new from this fo uh, photo. But uh, I want to say, hey, I want to log in to my iCloud on my phone. I don't know if it's trusted. So I have a little uh, message that pops up on my laptop that says, hey, are you going to let that uh, login in? Allow, not allow. And so that's that authorization with uh, certain devices. Uh, the, a benefit of this one, it's not actually visible when you have your phone locked. So if you think about uh, you may have text messages, can you see them when your phone's locked? Sometimes, depends on what the, the defaults on your, uh, it is. But I don't want to be negative, but we're also talking about security. We have some uh, drawbacks with push-based notification. So Uber learned a hard lesson on September 15th, 2022 this year. So they had a privileged user who had uh, compromised uh, user credentials. They already knew their password, but he had a uh, multi-factor authentication enabled. It was push-based notification. Unfortunately, it was uh, vulnerable to spamming. So pretty much what uh, the malicious actor was able to do was spam the user with those notifications until they just said, fucking allow that because I, don't, I want to stop getting these notifications. And that was the main entry point in for this uh, September 15th. Oh, can you guys still hear me? Is the hair in the way? Uh, that was the main entry point here for the September 15th attack. So yeah, push-based, it's good, but you have to consider uh, the options with that. One that's available, uh, you might see, especially in uh, different Okta systems, is secured questions. This one's fairly controversial in that um, some people don't consider it a true factor. This is something that it's kind of knowledge. You, as a user, will answer a set of questions during your sign-up flow. Uh, maybe, for example, you know, who is Mary's um, mother's maiden name? Or you might go with, you know, what's the Shire's address? These are knowledge based. So is it really another factor since you're already using your knowledge with your password? It's a kind of a balance. Uh, a lot of the time what you may see more used for is password reset purposes. Then you have email type of verification. So as your user kind of logs in, the user, uh, they may receive an email with a verification code in it. 
It's convenient because all of our users, in order to use our applications and services, probably also already have email addresses. So I'm not going to do the hand thing again. I'm not going to make you say that you have an email address. I assume everybody has email addresses. So it's convenient. Uh, it's something that our users know how to do. Hopefully, our users know how to do email. I feel bad for you if your users don't know how to do email on that one. Uh, and, but the thing to consider is how easy it is it for your users to change their email? Because if it's really easy for your users to change their email, it's really easy for malicious actors to change your users' emails. Um, so just an example, like if you haven't seen uh, email verification, it might be something that says, hey, this is a one-time code, have to do some education because your users may have forgotten they actually signed up for it at the time. And you want to make sure they know if, why they're seeing this, because maybe it's somebody else who's actually trying to uh, get in that verification code. So kind of moving up the stack of our uh, choices, you know, SMS bad, uh, moving up, uh, we got TOTP, so time-based one-time password. This is considered to be a uh, app-based uh, kind of uh, approach. It's one that can be a soft token, and because it's, it's a software uh, it's shared symmetric uh, private key between maybe your application and then your user's uh, authentication app. And so this is something that was published by the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's been available for a while. It uses that shared symmetric uh, private key uh, cryptography going on. You have to get the key between your application as well as the user's app that they're using. And so you'll probably have seen this in use with like Authy, Google Authenticator, or uh, 1Password. And so the most secure way might be token-based. So this is uh, Google's uh, Titan key here. And uh, what it is is a physical key that can actually authenticate. Uh, some of the standards you'll definitely see around this is like the FIDO2 WebAuthn standard. It's a USB device that is a physical device that you have to hold or your user has to hold and uh, may use like near field technology. I'm talking Bluetooth, NFC going on in here that when you do your login step, you need to press a little button. And a lot of these use universal second factor, which you may see UTF, FIDO2, and WebAuthn all kind of confused together. But it's uh, the FIDO Alliance, which kind of drives this open standard for using these technologies. And so kind of, you know, those top two, we got the TOTP and uh, using the physical keys. What is kind of the differences between that one-time password and UTF? See, we're technology. I'm making sure you guys got plenty of TLDs going on here. Uh, with that, you know, you have to, user has to type in a code. Uh, I have my verification code on my phone. I'm logging in on my computer. You have to usually set up and provision this. It's something that uh, shared symmetric keys, that means they both know that shared private key. That also means that it's a single point of attack, especially if somebody gets into your database where you have all those saved at. UTF, uh, a little bit different. So you got your physical device going on there. You got strong security from public key uh, cryptography going on. And we all know that apps know a lot more about ourselves than we may not know, uh, TikTok. Uh, so they know a lot of stuff. So do you know what your app for your authenticator app knows about you? I'm not sure either. So one good thing with uh, when we're using our YubiKey or Titan key. Uh, no personal identifiable details are usually associated with those keys. So, how would you stay awesome now? Well, one thing we could consider is maybe we should change our password from password and do a little bit longer password and passphrase. Secure ourselves with a different authentication method with that US telco, that wasn't really protecting our details with that uh, phone number. Maybe if people aren't protecting our phone numbers out there, maybe we should use a different phone number. And don't reuse passwords. This is one that seems super obvious, and people always still do it. <laughs> uh, if you have uh, multiple different user logins, 
have a different password for each of those multiple user logins, which I'm going to keep on saying this one because people still keep on doing it. Uh, and so let's help ourselves and not do it. And uh, if you have a phone provider that allows you to add that additional friction when you are changing something on your account, always opt into it. Encourage your users to opt into it because a little bit of friction is sometimes what's helped you from being compromised. And so this can help us keep on being awesome. But we're only 20 minutes in. I think we need to take a little twist on our story. Well, this would definitely make us uh, so that uh, the Lord of the Rings extended edition would be not necessary. So not quite that kind of twist. Let's consider we are now engineers. And as we all saw uh, Dave Farley's uh, talk uh, yesterday for the opening keynote, we're engineers, not developers. Uh, and so we're going to uh, work at Shiregram, you know, which is not at all going to be a copyright sued by Instagram. Uh, at all, and so we're, we're going to be an insta rival. And uh, we need to consider, we know there's a lot of bad stuff out there, there's a lot of bad actors, and we kind of know what they might be doing. How can we protect our users from it? Well, something to consider is security is everybody's job. As engineers, what can we do to help uh, encourage the security? Well. One thing is, is while you're de developing a feature, figure out uh, like where it might be vulnerable at. Consider uh, best practices around your web application security. Actually tune into what's going on on OWASP and know what the OWASP uh, top 10 is. Uh, we have so many different places as uh, developers that we can incorporate security in our software development lifecycle. Sometimes it get, goes to the wayside because of you know time and uh, money, but it's one of those things that when you know shit hits the fan, it really hits the fan. As designers, so pro your product designer, you, your user experience, how can you help encourage security? How can you make sure it's visible? How can you make sure it's findable? How can you can make sure it's a, a user experience that people like? How can you make sure that what you're displaying on the screen is what should be displayed on the screen? Infrastructure. Think about what services have access to maybe privileged information. How is your, your database going to be uh, stored? Where is it going to be saved at? Who can access it? Infrastructure has so many different ways that can help and encourage the security going on here. Managers. You guys don't just have to attend meetings. You can also help out with our security. You can prioritize the tickets. You can encourage your engineers and your direct reports to do the research, to give them time and the, the um, money to actually be able to look into what they need to research. So with that, that's a lot of things that we don't need to rely on InfoSec for. And when stuff does fail, it can fail really in big, bad ways. Let's look. So this is from 2019 on Ring. Ring made it really, really easy to put internet video, or well, video on the internet. What did they do to protect that uh, internet video? A password, a single password. And uh, do we know that our users usually opt for a nice, long, you know, secure passwords? No. So those uh, different places, like your kid's room, were able to be streamed and maybe talked to by people on the internet. Was this something that people felt strongly about the Ring brand? Did this make them feel good? No. I think a lot of users lost a lot of confidence in what was going on here. And so we want to make sure we consider what can we do to not lose our user confidence. And we, this is one of those things that you're going to be like, hey, I came here to learn something new. I'm going to say, yeah, we got to learn something new, but we also need to consider most of the time with where the attacks are at, it's with our security basics. We need to encourage strong passwords and passphrases. We, 
and this may be a little controversial, don't make your users rotate them all the time. Yes, they do need to be rotated sometimes, especially if there's been any sort of a database breach. But does making a user have to come up with a new password every 30 days encourage them to do something that's secure? Or are they gonna just do the thing that they can remember because they have to do a new password every 30 days? When you store your password, don't store the password, just store the hash and do it securely. And consider what data you need to have stored because it's usually not a if my database is gonna be compromised, it's when my database is gonna be compromised. And if you only store what little you actually need, the better off you are. Also, uh, I don't know if it, here in Australia you have the PCI standards, payment uh, credit card industry. Those are super fun and everybody loves to opt into security audits or not. So if you don't need to store those payment details, don't do that. Also like Eno, I enjoy a good XKZD comic. This one is a wonderful way of kind of showing password entropy and kind of talk about and discuss password strength. Why does password entropy matter and how does this actually help our users? Well, greater entropy usually means it's harder to brute force a password. We really want to try to be, make our passwords hard to guess but easy to remember, which that's, it kind of does sound like a contradictory stand, uh, statement, but that's where the past phrases really come into account. It's hard for people, we're not wired to just remember this short little uh, number, uppercase, you know, add a special character type situation, but give us a sentence, we can remember sentences. So that's where a passphrase comes in, uh, into play. And so with that, Entropy, adding that extra length and that little bit of randomness gets you that more entropy. And maybe I'm not explaining this too well, so let's uh, dive in on what this might look like uh, with how we can see the entropy in action. So this is using uh, the GRC's uh, interactive brute force kind of password. Uh, for God's sake, do not put any production passwords in here to just check on it, but like maybe we get, give other you know password tests in here. Uh, and so let's say you know a developer engineer standby test one, two, three. How is that entropy on that? You can see that you know it's it's kind of low. If we actually had some resources, we had a, um, just a fast attack scenario, uh, maybe 35 seconds to brute force test one, two, three. Let's consider I have even more resources. Maybe I got a cluster going on and when I want to do my brute forcing. I have a fraction of a second to get that. But passphrase, passphrase adds just a tiny bit more entropy going on here. So uh, just picking any four words, correct horse battery staple going on here, and maybe don't do correct horse battery staple because I'm pretty sure like somebody has probably coded up a dictionary table for that one uh, by now. Uh, with that, is this a little bit more than a, a 35 seconds and a, you know, a, a fraction of a second? We're talking about adding friction. This adds 1.24 thousand trillion billion centuries. Trillion, I did not add a billion, but yes, trillion. And so this entropy is what helps out with the additional friction. So with our password policies, as somebody who's in control of uh, being able to uh, have password policies, let's look at some good ones that are something that might help out our users. So this is GitHub. As engineers, we're definitely familiar with GitHub. GitHub does a great uh, thing with their uh, password policies. So you can see here, they don't make a user guess at all what to put in for a password. You can see they have options here. They say, hey, 
go for this many characters, or you know, maybe try out this flexibility, as well as, do you see how one part's green? It's dynamic. It helps them help themselves with while they're selecting the password. And this is important. It's at the time that the users are actually doing the password. It's not like trying on another screen. It's right when they're actually creating the password for the first time. This is a, just another example. Different way of helping the users have a checklist of while they're actually creating that password. It's one of those things that the more we can do to help encourage our users, and especially at the time when they're doing it, the better it, the password that they'll have in the end. This was a little bit a more low key example uh, from Reddit, but it's still one of those that you can see over the left, that's kind of that password strength, password entropy type level here. And it's just giving that visual while you're actually creating your password. And you know, maybe there's a couple places that we can consider cautionary tales with their password policies. So LinkedIn uh, might be a place that a few people uh, pay attention to. This is theirs. I don't know what is even going on with any of this. I, I, I know I have to have at least six, uh, six characters, but I don't know anything else. It's not doing anything to help me. It doesn't tell me what my max is. It doesn't tell me what sort of characters are you guys gonna want. Um, and this is a little bit older, but uh, they only accepted, so at a minimum, six characters. So I was like, oh, six lowercase a's, you know, that seems like legit. And it was accepted. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna try tomorrow, yesterday, and see, maybe they've updated. They haven't updated, unfortunately. It's still six characters, but good news, I could not do six A's. I had to do five A's and a B. <laughs> so uh, this is one that should be used a little bit more as a cautionary tale. They're not really encouraging their users to help themselves with a little bit more secure passwords. And so we talked about like needing to store your hash securely, but what it, it, password hash encryption should we even do? Well. What this is, is it's just an algorithm that will take your data. Hey, I have your password. You know, it could be anywhere between eight characters to 60 characters. But what I produce in the end, that hash, that hash value, is always going to be the same fixed length output. And so uh, with that, uh, there's good and bad hashing encryptions that we can consider. So, and some are considered stronger than others. Uh, MD5 SHA-1. Good hashing, password hashing encryption? No. This is one that's uh, been cracked uh, for a good long time. It's, uh, what they did with this is they really wanted to try to optimize it for uh, creating that hash very fast, which actually turned out to be a bad thing. Uh, but we have other ones that we can uh, consider uh, going with a SHA-2. Uh, SHA-2 is still recommended. There is the, the SHA-3 out there also. But these are you know, optimized for speed but also optimized for additional pessimization to you know, just make it and discourage that brute force attack. And if you want to get spicy, let's go with a adaptive one-way function on uh, creating our hash. So with these, is, it uh, is a way to actually compute and to generate that one-way irreversible uh, transform. So change my password into my big long hash. And with that, there's usually a work factor uh, associated with it, so how it, it generates that irreversibility. So um, how much space does it take? How long does it generate? It can be slow, but slow in a good way. And some examples of what this is, uh, argon2, uh, peanut butter something or other, I don't know, Scripta. And uh, as a Rubyist, uh, Bcrypt is one of, uh, that it has been widely adopted uh, by the Ruby community. And with these, uh, it should be taken into account, just head on over to OWASP, the only issue slay, which is the newest uh, password hashing and encryption competition winner. And that's usually when you have a new technology that you're looking at implementing, just go ahead and do that. One thing to take away, 
don't make your own password hash algorithm unless that's literally what you do for a living. Uh, usually, it, do it yourself is not a route that you want to go with your password hashing. <laughs> So let's take an example from uh, another real world, uh, maybe don't. Uh, so Heroku, uh, owned by Salesforce here in uh, May 5th, uh, 2022, uh, just found out they had had uh, their database compromised. It just happened to be a user database with the password and the salts associated with them. OAuth tokens, you know, those aren't something that you really want exposed out to the public were, and then they required that all their users have to have their passwords reset because they knew that their users probably didn't have any other authentication to help protect them. So you got a kind of crappy user experience because their users were all those apps out there, and, but then they had to have that reset and then they had additional like awful communication. So another way to lose your user confidence. And so let's move on with our user authentication journey. We have a intersection on our decision. Which way should we go? Should we do it ourselves with our user identity? Or should we maybe consider, do we need a vendor to bring it? Should we buy? If we buy, we got choices. Uh, uh, one of the most common ones that you'll probably see within the enterprise uh, is Okta going on. Uh, but there's plenty of other choices uh, with uh, different uh, vendors out there. But you have to consider when you buy, you're tying your user identity to a third party vendor. Choose your vendor wisely. Consider with them do they allow you to opt into the factors that you want your users to be using? Are they storing your credentials securely? Are they making it sure that you can have control of your own data? Do they have plenty of APIs that your developers can use to access that user identity? What are your actual needs? Because if we consider if you're a small startup, Maybe what you need is small and like you just need to access the basic authentication going on there, allow for some MFA. Maybe you are an enterprise a company who has hundred thousands of users. It's kind of different what you may need for one versus another. If you're going to make it yourself, which you know, we know no, uh, we're not doing our own password hashing, but we could do our own user login and identity management experience. We got flexibility on our side. You can make all your own choices, but we have a lot more security surface to cover. So you think about all those uh, pages that are, are internet accessible, do you have those locked down? Are you making sure users with elevated privileges can only access a small amount of things? You have more control over your user experience. Maybe design and uh, how your login flow is very specific to your app or what you need to do. So this would give you those choices, but consider when are you going to actually require that re-authentication of the, that multi-factor? Are you going to pop that up every time your user has a new IP address? Are you going to pop it at a time they use a new browser? Are you going to just make them do it every single time? This is something to consider on what to do. But no matter what your choice, you're going with a vendor, or maybe you're uh, doing, handling your own user management. Rate limiting with your user login, with your entry of your verification code, helps prevent brute force attacks. If you only have one ladder of orcs coming up at your castle, that's a lot less orcs than if you have a whole, if you have like, you know, 20. And one way of doing that is by using a truncated backoff, exponential backoff algorithm. Maybe we're not familiar with that, but this concept is one of those that once we kind of break it down, it's uh, easy to see how it helps. So it's one of those things that you allow a user to log in, they get the, it, their password incorrect, you will let them be able to log in again. But that second login, you make them wait a little bit of time. Maybe it's, you know, a second, maybe it's a second plus a little bit extra. 
it's one of those things that as they uh, go on and uh, it curves up, how much time you make them wait before they can log in again. So that's the exponential part. Um, but with it, you want to make sure it's one of those things that it's not easy to guess the amount of time. Because as soon as it's easy to guess the amount of time, it's easy to script that amount of time. And if it's easily scriptable, you have somebody that's probably working on a script to get into that. With all of these, we're encouraging our users to add additional optional security. Do users like additional optional security? No. So this is one of those things that we want to make it easy on them. We want to make it easy to opt in. Maybe when you're doing your user uh, sign up flow, additionally, after they uh, set up their account, you offer them the opportunity to opt in to uh, the multi-factor authentication choice. You want to make sure it's easy to add. You want to, uh, if you have users who are looking for it, can they add it without jumping through hoops? Can your users find even where it's at? Do you have it hidden underneath a whole bunch of submenus, or is it right underneath your account section? You want to make it flexible. If users can't enable it when they need to enable it, if they can't change it when they need to change it, they're just going to write it off and not use it at all. So some examples of a flow. This was actually one of my first features I worked on when I started at a WP Engine, was enabling multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication. I definitely have things that now that I know better, I want to do better on it. But it's one of those things that it was easily visible, add it right in security. It had a self-stepper, uh, so you knew what was going on, what steps were going on, and it was easily explained and uh, gave the data right away to the customers. What I ask you is don't be like these companies. And maybe Twitter got their uh, multi-factor authentication API service back up and running, but who knows what's happening in that hot mess. But uh, all these companies don't even have multi-factor authentication as a choice. When you do it yourself, remember, you have to require more authentication. You have to make sure that maybe you're editing or removing those credentials. You want to add a little bit of friction so that if your user is in the middle of like a cross-site scripting attack or maybe they're experiencing a cores attack, that you don't make it easy to just turn off that additional step. You want to make sure that when you are failing in your authentication, because yeah, stuff is going to go wrong at some point in time. It always does. You want to make sure that you fail generically, which hurts our engineering souls, because we know we're going to be the ones who have to actually fix it in production uh, three months down the road. But it's one of those things that if you make it easy to figure out what's going wrong, you make it easy to figure out what's going wrong with whoever's scripting an attack. So just an example of what that might look like is, hey, it failed. This hurts the engineer, I know, because you want to know exactly what went wrong. But it's one of those things that it's not easy to script and know exactly what went wrong. These would be much more visible on exactly what failed. So as the people who are in control of helping out our users, are we doing all we can to protect them? This was a tweet not too long ago from Alice Goldfuss and was kind of talking about how as uh, product people, we may make fun of our users sometime and we may do them a disservice, but it's one of those that uh, it's most of the time when we hear about these attacks, is it our typical users who are the problem or is it ourselves that are the problem? So if you are an admin user, if you have root, you have the most privilege, so you also need to have the most amount of security around your user. It should be a requirement, and it should not be optional. It should also be probably just give everybody a UB key, and it'll be a lot happier, too. So let's consider uh, wrapping up our journey. I think I see more door in sight. And understand that multi-factor authentication can help us, but 
It's only one a step on our already good secure password policies. And maybe some MFA methods are a little bit more secure than others. So I will leave you with this. Friends, don't let friends use SMS authentication. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And so uh, I would uh, definitely advocate for, at some point, just lock the damn user out because there's probably a bad actor going on there. But sometimes, as engineers, we need to know all the tools that we have available. And you might be told by a CEO or CTO that you can't lock out your users. So you need to know what else you can do to help. And so that's why the little bit of randomness usually helps with exponential back off. All right, that's all we've got time for, but uh, I'm sure Christine will be in the hallway if you have further questions. Yeah. Thank you very much.